good morning everybody let's go ahead and stand to our feet man coming off of last week with easter how many know that we can celebrate our freedom in this place today amen? we got freedom because of what he did on the cross come on let's put our hands together Can we just lift our hands to Jesus in this place? Father, we are just so grateful to be here. We're so grateful that we can declare, God, that you are worthy of it all. Not just a little bit of us, not just a portion. But, Father, this morning we want to say that you are worthy of everything that we can offer to you. So this morning we lift our hands in worship, and we love you. Come on, don't miss this time of worship. Just focus on Jesus right now.
sing that one more time. I just want everybody in this place, let's lift our voice, let's sing it to Jesus one more time. Sing and I surrender all. Yes, just like that. And I surrender all. All to thee. And all to Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a shout today. We love you, Lord. You deserve it all, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on now. How many love Jesus in this place? Oh, come on now. I hope you love Jesus if you're at church. How many love Jesus in this place today? Thank you, Lord. Man, Easter was good, but how many know it doesn't stop just at the cross? He rose, and why did he rise? He rose for us to continue life, to continue telling somebody about who he is, what he's done in our life. Now here's a week later, and we're back into church saying, I surrender everything. So many times we have the worries of our life, of this world, on our mind, on our heart, but God is simply saying what we just sang. Just surrender it to me, and I'll take care of you. Amen. It is good to be in the house of God with you today. You know, normally right now, I would tell you, greet each other, be seated, do all that good stuff. But you know what? Vic, I don't know about you, but I think today's a special day. I think so. And you're going to wonder, what is he talking about? Today is a very special day. It's somebody's birthday. I don't know if I want to tell you who it is because you might jump out of your seat and just start hugging her. But today is Sister Lolly's birthday. Sister Lolly, 21 years old. There you go. So, you know, we were going to kind of do this at the end, but then as we were singing, I was like, you know, I kind of have the whole group up here with me, and I don't like when everybody says, let the worship leader sing happy birthday. Every time, we're going to sing happy birthday to you with everybody standing. You know what, Sam? We didn't practice this, but let's do it Latin style. Can we do that? So let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sister Lolly. We love you so much. Hey, well, as you're seated, now why don't you turn to somebody and say, is it your birthday too?
Good morning and welcome to Living Word Assembly. Amen. Yes. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Listen, I'm glad that you're here with us. Uh, for those of you that are participating online, welcome to Living Word Assembly. Listen, it's always good to see a familiar face and it's always good to see you guys here in the house of the Lord. Here at Living Word Assembly, we have a mission statement and our mission statement is connecting people to God to each other, the community, and the world. Amen. Super important to Pastor Vic that we understand that. That's what Living Word's about. Amen. And uh, listen, we do a pretty good job of all of those things, so you hear it often. Amen. Listen, if you are a first-time guest here at Living Word Assembly, we want to welcome you to Living Word Assembly. Listen, our hope is, is that uh, your experience has been a good one, that uh, walking up and being on campus, that people have been friendly and you've enjoyed the love of the people here at Living Word Assembly. We like to uh, pride ourselves on our campus being a loving, friendly campus. So I hope that you've experienced and continue to experience that today. Amen. But we're glad that you're with us. If you are a first-time guest, I want to draw your attention to the seat in front of you. There is a connect card there. You would guess what we want to do with you. We want to connect with you. It's a name, an email, and a phone number. And what that allows us to do, it gives us an opportunity to connect with you. We just want to send you an email. We want to acknowledge the fact that you were here. We think it's a good idea. We love guests and we love people that come to our church so we want to acknowledge and we just want to share a, a little gift with you so if you would do that if you would be so kind to fill that out you could give it to one of the ushers or you could go to the connect center and there's actually someone there that would like to shake your hand give you a personal hello not just a general hello from up here and we have a little gift just a little token of appreciation from us showing that we're glad that you came out and spend some time with us on a sunday morning amen because we're grateful for you so if you'd be so kind to do that thank you so let me connect you with what's going on here at Living Word Assembly. Listen, you can check your bulletin or you can go to livingwordchino.org to always find out because I realize I've been accused of speaking fast. So that may be true, uh, but I, either, either I speak fast or you listen slow. It's one of the two, but it's either one. You can always go back and reference that stuff. So let me start before Pastor Vic comes up and shares the word of God. Amen. Discipleship Academy begins April 14th. That is next week. And listen, it's a four-week course. It goes through May 5th. And uh, listen, we want you to register. Our hope is that if you're here at Living Word Assembly and you've never taken these classes, the expectation is that you would take them. Every person that calls Living Word their church home, our expectation or the expectation for you is to take these classes. So the first one that's coming up is April 14th, and that's Discovering Living Word. And that is basically a history lesson. You'll get to meet Pastor Vic. Pastor Vic will tell you about the history of the church, how we've gotten to the point, and then what the vision of the church is moving forward. And you'll get an opportunity to meet the staff. So it's a great opportunity. The second class is uh, discovering my, uh, my, uh, my ministry. So in this class, what you do is you're going to take an assessment course that's going to help you understand what God has created you to do. Some of you here are thinking about serving or you want to get involved, but you don't know where to get involved. This test, this assessment is going to help you for what God has created you, right? We, we use an acronym called the SHAPE. And uh, these things will help you figure out what God has created you for. So the hope is, is that it will help you get connected into serving in a ministry. The third class is discovering my spiritual maturity. Listen, as Christians, the one thing that we understand is the things that we no longer do, right? I'm a Christian now. I no longer do these things. But it's more important that you understand what you are to do moving forward. Amen? And, and it's a lot more than just coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday. There's a lot more that the word asks and, and the functions of a Christian and you'll learn that in, class, in that third class. In the last class, it's called My Life Mission. And in that fourth class, you're going to learn how do, you, how do you be on mission. In other words, we're not all called to be missionaries, to go other places. But God has definitely called all of us to be on mission. Whether that's at your workplace, in your neighborhood, within your family. And this is going to show you how to share your testimony, how to develop a testimony, and how to share that testimony. So listen, these classes are great for new Christians. They're great for... Uh, seasoned Christians, because we forget, right? Pastor Vic says it all the time. We forget 95% of what we hear. So in this class, you'll get, uh, you'll get documentation that you'll have, and you'll be able to keep, and you'll be able to review. So listen, our hope is that you get signed up. We're super excited. You can register online, or you can scan that QR code there in your uh, bulletin and sign up. Amen? Amen. I know that was a lot of information, but uh, you can reference it there. Men's breakfast, Saturday, April 13th. How many men do I have in the building? All right. All right, man. Thank you for that. It's uh, from 8 to 11 a.m. in the fellowship hall. It's $10 a person. Listen, you're not going to get a breakfast like this for no $10. Amen. But listen, uh, they have an amazing speaker and Pastor Jimmy Rocha. Uh, listen, invite somebody. Invite your friend, a coworker, a family member. 
And uh, like I said, they may not want to come to church, but they'll come to a free breakfast. They just tell me you're going to take them to breakfast, and I'm paying, and uh, bring them to church. Amen. They can't just leave, right? You're driving, so bring them. Uh, Honduras mission trip, 2024. Uh, for those of you that have been looking for an opportunity to go on a mission trip, here is our next one. It's July 5th through the 10th. Uh, you can contact Brother Pete Bustillos or Bree uh, Viteri for more information. Listen, you may not be able to go to this mission trip, but there's more that are coming along the line. So you may want to talk to Brother Pete or Bree and see how do you how do you start that? Where do you, where do you start with that so that you can make it for the next one if you can't make it for this one? Merge, marriage ministry, Friday, April 12th. Uh, this Friday, we are going to be having our merge marriage ministry. The location is to be determined because we move around. But listen, you can contact myself or my wife, and uh, we'll put you in contact. We provide child care. There's potluck style. So we encourage you to bring what you like, your favorite food. And listen, the only requirement is that you're married. We have some people that have been married for 50 years, 30 years. Some people have been married for five months. But listen, come. You'll enjoy it. We, we eat, we hang out, and we discuss things of marriage. Amen. So come and hang out with us. Baptism. Those of you that are interested in getting baptized, May 26th, we are going to be having baptisms after second service. We're always excited. Last, uh, our last go-ahead, we, I think we had about 14 people that got baptized. So we're looking for that amount, if not more. Amen. So listen, if you've been thinking about or contemplating or know somebody who has been contemplating baptism, here is your opportunity. You'll hear more about it in the next coming weeks. There is a class that you have to take before you can get baptized so you'll need to schedule for that, but you'll get all that information there if you scan that QR code. Amen? Amen. Listen, I want to thank you guys for your faithfulness, and I want to remind you that there's four ways to give. There are these black boxes on your way out. You can go to livingwordchino.org, and you can give there. You can put it in the mail. Or if for the same amount of money, you can probably drive here, and uh, someone is here to receive your envelope and your offering. Amen? And uh, we always enjoy seeing your faces. So let me pray for you before Pastor Vic comes up and shares the word. Amen? Lord God, today, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for every day. Lord, and every opportunity, God, that you give us to love and to be loved. And today, Lord, I pray for your people. Lord, I pray, God, that you would continue to bless your people. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless, Lord, their homes. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless their families, Lord, their health, Lord, and their finances. Lord, today, Lord, I pray that at Living Word, Lord, as a congregation, Lord, that we would understand, Lord, that the things that we put you first in, Lord, the things that we commit to you, God, you bless those things and you honor that, God. So today, Lord, I thank you for that and I thank you for your goodness and your continued faithfulness, Lord, in our life, Lord. Thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, and what you're going to continue to do, Lord, in the lives of your people, Lord. We thank you this. We ask this in your son's precious and wonderful name. Amen. How many of you guys are ready for the word of God? All right, help me welcome Senior Pastor Vic. Amen, amen. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you're in the house of the Lord. Those of you watching online, we're so glad you're with us. Honey, how does it feel to be 55? By the way, this year, we'll be married 49 years. Well, that's a problem. You would have been six. So I'm lying. Forgive me. No, no. Uh, how are you? I, I, lo I love what you think of okay, me. Good. Yes, yes. I tell my, my, uh, my, grand, my grandson from Utah called me early this morning, and he goes, Grandma, how does it feel? They go, don't say it. If you're going to say it, say it backwards. <laughs> and he goes, that's my grandma, yeah. So grateful today to be in the house of the Lord. We were singing, he is worthy of it all. Amen. When you say and you sing that, what is all? What is it that you're offering to God? And that question comes into my mind when I'm singing to the Lord. He's worthy of it all. It all means all, all that I am, all that he has done, all that he has given me. Especially today, I celebrate another year of life. Some people say, don't you get sad because we're getting no? I go, why should I be sad? God is giving me another year of life. And I'm here and I know him and he's my savior and I love him. And he has blessed me and I am just rejoicing that I have another year of life. I thank the Lord for his mercy, his kindness and his love. But if we were singing, he is worthy of it all. I pray that you acknowledge the words that you sing, because I do. I just, I love singing to the Lord. I love, pra I love praising his name, but I'm always aware of what I'm saying. And I says, Lord, all of it, all of it. Since I was a little girl, I told you all of it was you. And you know, I get melancholic because I miss my parents. My parents will have nothing but beautiful things to say to me. 
But once they're gone to be with the Lord, God has given me a beautiful family. They repeat the same things to me. I'm so grateful for my kids, my daughters, my grandchildren, and my husband that is a man of God that has loved me through all these years and guided me and taught me how to be loyal to my Lord. That was my father. And then the Lord sent me someone else that will keep us in, in, in the right had to, to love our God. So today, Isaiah 25, 1, and I love to repeat this verse because it really is my, my praise, my, my prayer, my expression of love. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. And I praise his name today for all of you that are here today. Your church looks beautiful and you are beautiful. I always tell my people and friends, my church is the prettiest, beautiful people of Chino. And when they're all here, they look so beautiful, all these colors. And I know God is in the midst of, our, of, of, this, of this reunion every time we step on the house of the Lord. So to him, be all the praise, be all the glory. And I pray that you guys enjoy the rest of this day. Don't forget when you sing, examine what you sing and let it all be unto the, the arms of the Lord. God bless you, church, your love and pray for daily. I know I don't know all your names, but I pray for everyone that calls Living Word their church. Father, bless them, be with them. And I know he does. To God be the praise and the glory. Amen. 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 Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, this November will be 49 years that we've been married, and uh, it's, it's flown, it's gone fast. But God has been good to us. Amen. Listen, on that Living Word Academy, if you're new to Living Word, sign up. You're, you, you need to go through those classes. Uh, you need to know what we're about. You need to know what, what it means uh, to be a part of Living Word. Uh, it's very important, and uh, please do that. You know, today's Communion Sunday, and I want to I wanna talk to you. Uh, I, wanna, I, I chose the theme of communion, uh, but, but I want to develop the theme, and I want you to follow me. I hope I don't lose you as I develop the theme of communion. But, you know, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is, why, why did Jesus come? You know, and there are many reasons the Bible gives why Jesus came. You know, of course, we know that Jesus came to reveal the Father. The Bible says that. He came to save sinners. He came to die on the cross. We, we know all of that. But let me give you some scriptures that gives us a, a couple of other ideas of why Jesus Christ came. Uh, in the Gospel of Mo John, chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give you a quality of life beyond what the world can give you. Uh, a life, I, you hear me say, life is better with Jesus. And we get better at life when we have Jesus. That's why he came. Over there in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, uh, verse 13 through 17, notice what it says. And then he went out again by the sea and all the multitude came to him and he taught them. And he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and he followed Jesus. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors had, and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came to those who knew they were lost. You know what? And he would forgive them and save them. There are many since Jesus' days that feel, I'm good enough. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? You have the right to believe that, but really you're lost. But I've come, I've come for those that are lost and those that need salvation. Over there in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Jesus as the son just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus Christ came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and eventually give his life for the sins of the world. So that, those scriptures and answer the question, why did Jesus come? Many amazing reasons, and there's a, there's a whole lot more. But probably a, a more difficult question would be, how? How did Jesus come? And some of you will say, well, Pastor, that's not that hard. We know how he came. He came through the Virgin Mary. As she found herself with child, you know what, by the Holy Spirit. 
We know that he came preaching and teaching and doing miracles and doing healings. And by the way, all of that is true. But one of the things that the religious leaders observed about how he came is found in Luke chapter 7 and verse 34 when it says this. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, these are the words of the religious leaders in the days of Jesus. And of course, they want to discredit Jesus. By the way, their observation was not wrong. Jesus did come, and he did hang around, as we read earlier, with sinners. He hung around with tax collectors. He hung, he hung around with people that the religious leaders of his time thought you should not hang around. Those people are outcasts. You know what? It's not worth, worth wasting your time on some people. But Jesus came, you know what? And he hung around with the most unlikely people. You know, and of course, they tried to discredit him. They, they, they spun it in a way that made Jesus look like a drunkard and a glutton. In other words, he's a party animal. And how can he be a man of God if he's a party animal? And of course, as I told you, they were not wrong. Jesus was a very relational type of person. Jesus hung around, hung around with all kinds of people. It was important to Jesus to develop community and have relationships with everybody. By the way, that, that message has been lost today because sometimes as Christians, we are very exclusive. We only want to hang around with Christians. You know what? We only want to rub shoulders with Christians. And, and yet I say to you, how are we going to win the world? How are we going to influence our friends if all we do is hang around with the good people in our lives? Amen? Amen. Now, i got to be careful because there's some of you that are brand new Christians and you gave your life recently and God has taken you out of an environment. You don't need to be going back into that environment right away. But all of us at some point need to let our light shine and talk to people and share the love of Jesus Christ with, with other people. But I want to I wanna tie that into communion. Jesus came to develop relationships. It was important for, for Jesus to have community with people. And, and the religious leaders saw that and they were absolutely right. However, how they spun it was wrong. But today is Communion Sunday, and I want us to look at communion. I want to talk to you about it, and I want to tie it in to what I just told you right now. But you know, for us, communion, communion is not a sacrament. Communion is what we call an ordinance. And some of you might ask yourself, well, what's the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance? Well, the difference is this. A sacrament is seen as a means of grace by God, from God. In other words, sacrament, the word sacrament means when you do these things, a certain amount of grace, unmerited favor, something spiritual, something miraculous happens when you do these things. That's what a sacrament is. And of course, an ordinance is something that says, is something Christians do that demonstrates who we are. We are followers of Jesus Christ. It demonstrates that we are participants of faith. We don't believe it imparts any grace. We don't believe that the things that we do, these ordinances, we don't believe that they impart any certain amount of grace. They're things we do because it reveals who we are and we're being obedient to what Jesus said we should do. So in the Christian world, we view, we have two ordinances only that we believe the Bible teaches. And it's the ordinance of baptism. We get baptized because Jesus said, get baptized. Go into the whole world, make disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we do communion because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me often until I come again. So those are the two ordinances that the Protestant, the Christian church follows. Now, if you are from a Catholic background, of course, in the Catholic background, they have sacraments. Now, I, I'm, what I'm going to tell you right now is I'm not trying to put down Catholicism. I want to inform you. I want to give you some, I want, I want you to know, people ask these questions, and I simply want to try to answer them. You know what? And in the Catholic Church, they have sacraments. And this is, I took this from the Catholic Encyclopedia. This is what they say about sacraments. Sacraments are outward signs of inward grace instituted by Christ for our sanctification. Now, what does that mean? That means that there are things that we do that cause something to happen inside of us. You know what? Jesus told us to do them, and when we do them, we show that we are holy. That's what sanctification means. We are separated unto the Lord, and that is the sacrament. And the, the, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that, that there are seven sacraments. Those of you that grew up in Catholicism, you know what they are. Those of you that don't, didn't grow up, uh, you don't know them. So I want to just share them with you real quick. And, and, and remember, all of these things impart grace, something supernatural, a miracle, something happens when you participate in these rituals. And the first one, of course, is baptism. You know, and the Roman Catholic Church teaches that babies are to get baptized, and baptism washes away original sin. In other words, all of us are born with sin, the Catholic Church, and we believe this, with sin, and it has to be washed, it has to be eliminated before you can move on and develop a relationship with God. 
And uh, in Catholicism, that's very important. It's one of the major ones. I did not grow up Catholic. And I remember in the little community I grew up in, you know what, we, I would have theological discussions with my friends when I was 12, 13 years old. And they would say, you're not Catholic? I said, no, you haven't been baptized? I said, no. Then you know what, you shouldn't have a name. Because names are not given until you're baptized. As a matter of fact, you are in between a human being and an animal because it's what baptism is what makes you human. And, it's, and they understood this. It's what washes away sin. So, and we would have these discussions. But it's a sacrament. Something spiritual, something holy happens when you get baptized. It washes away and it makes you acceptable to God. That's the first one. It starts there. The second sacrament is penance or what we know as confession. And of course, the sacrament of penance is... You know what? The priests have the authority to absolve you of your sins. Absolve is another word for saying forgive you of your sins. And they get that from the first pope, Peter, who hand, has handed it down to his successors who are the popes. They give the priests the authority, you know what, to forgive your sins. And if you do certain things, you know, the Hail Marys and all the Our Fathers and all the, all the things that you do, they then say you are absolved of your sins. You are forgiven. And they believe that when you confess your sins, grace is given. Uh, a miracle happens. <clears throat> of course, we believe in all of this, just a little different. <clears throat> the third one is the Eucharist, or, or what we call communion. And in Catholicism, communion, when you take the bread and when you take the wine, in, in, in Catholic uh, theology, it, it, they believe that at, at, at the moment of consecration, you know, the priest goes to the tabernacle in the, in the back, he pulls out a wafer about this big, he lifts it up, and he's, he prays a prayer of consecration. And at that moment, the, the host is called a host, which means in the Latin, it means victim. It, at that moment, it converts into literally the body of Jesus Christ. You hear those little bells, remember? Ring. I don't know if they still do it. But it sort of cued you that, you know, there was a miracle that happened. So when you went and took communion, and you do it, they do, uh, you are literally eating the body of Christ, and literally you are drinking the body of Christ, and when you do that, uh, you know what, you are, you, are part, you are literally receiving, and a miracle happens, grace is imparted, you know what, you are literally receiving Christ at that moment, and of course in Catholicism, you do it every day if you want to, uh, and of course you have to go and confess before you do it, and I don't know how many people that take communion in Catholic Church go and confess anymore, but that's one of the sacraments. And of course, the, the other one, the fourth one is confirmation. The confirmation is, it used to be when you were 13, 14 years old. Now they're doing it as young as 11, 12. And confirmation is a, a, is a formal acceptance of that, in, that, that child into the church. And they are especially anointed with the Holy Spirit. At that moment, that's like their salvation experience. That's the moment you're part of the church. Up to that, you know what, you're, 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 you're making your way. But confirmation, you're now part of the church and you, you take communion. Now you can participate in communion. <clears throat> and then the fifth one, the fifth sacrament is the anointing of the sick. And the priest does that. It's also known as the, uh, you know, uh, extreme unction for those that are dying or uh, right, the, 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 the last rites or final anointing. And, and what that means is if you're sick or, you know, they, they, they do that. And, and they believe in healing. They believe that at, at that point God can heal you. Of course, when you die, it prepares you to go to heaven or purgatory, wherever you're going to go. And that's called, that's called the anointing of the sick. And then number six is holy orders. Holy orders is, is a recognition that, you know, the clergy, the process by which men are ordained into the clergy, you become a priest. That is a sacrament. You know, that isn't just for anyone. There's a process, and at some point, you are ordained by the church. And one of the big, uh, one of the questions that I get often by Catholics is, uh, so what makes you a pastor? What right do you have a pastor? What's your devotion that gives you the right to be a pastor? And when I tell them, when God called me, and they say, yeah, but did you go through a process? And I say, yes, we all go, we go through a process. Now, a lot of them don't. And uh, they say, well, do you have the education? I say, I probably have more education than most priests have. Amen. And, uh, but, uh, you know, they ask, but holy orders. And only the church can confer that. Uh, the bishops can confer that. And then number seven is matrimony, marriage. You know, when you get married, that's a sacrament. It gives you a special grace. Uh, God you know, does something to help you make it through your marriage, because marriage is difficult. And that's why in Catholicism, divorce is a no-no. It's a, it's, a, it's, a ser it's a very serious sin. And uh, for the longest time, uh, they were very strict. Now, I think, in America anyway, uh, uh, divorce means nothing to Christians or to Catholics. Amen. It's happening like never before. But those are the seven sacraments. And I, I, I didn't mean to bore you, but I, I, I want you to know the difference between ordinances and, and, and sacraments. <clears throat> 
And you know, we, we reject sacraments because the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. And you know what? So that no one can vote. In other words, here's what the Bible says. You know what? Grace, grace is unmerited favor. What Christ did on the cross, he died for us. He made available something called grace, meaning you could not earn it. You could never deserve this. But when you exercise faith and you appropriate what Christ did on the cross, your sins are forgiven. And the Bible teaches that we are saved by faith. Faith plus nothing else equals salvation. Not faith plus baptism, not faith plus penance, not faith plus, you know what, going to church, not faith plus giving, not faith plus all the others. No, faith plus nothing, zero equals salvation. We are saved by, faith, by grace through faith, and, and that's what the Bible teaches. So we believe that there's nothing we can do to earn or deserve or ever pay back what Christ did on the cross. All we can do is surrender ourselves and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. And the moment we do that, the Bible says that we are forgiven by God. Amen. And if we die, we go to heaven. Not to purgatory. We go to heaven. You know, the Bible says that as many as received him, that he give the right, the power to become children of God. We're all creation of God, but we're not all children of God. Who are the children of God? Those that have given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And it's not that doesn't say those that, you know, go through uh, the sacraments, not even those that go through baptism. Baptism, we recognize it, but it doesn't save you. Some people say, well, I, I need to get baptized to be saved. I go, no, you're wrong. Baptizing won't. Well, when I take communion, you know what? It helps me get closer to God. You know what? It does, but not because anything special happens when you take communion. So w- with that said, I want to talk to you about communion. Uh, I, I want to give you an idea of what happens. You know, when Jesus, uh, before he died, he met with his disciples, and of course they gathered to celebrate Passover, which was a Jewish holiday, which they still practice today. It's the remembrance of God bringing the the Israelis, the Jewish people, out of Egypt under the mighty hand of Moses. And they still do that today, called called Passover. They, They do a Seder. They have a whole meal. And it's an interesting meal. And uh, the Bible says that Jesus met with his disciples, being a Jew, he wanted to celebrate the Passover. But, you know, uh, when they would meet, uh, when they would have dinners, in the Jewish culture, when they had a dinner, it's not like our culture. You know, well, we, we, today when we have a, a meal, sometimes you sit down and eat it by yourself. Nobody's around. You know what, well, sometimes we eat because we have to eat, and, or sometimes we sit down and eat because we want to enjoy the tasty food. But in Jewish culture, having a meal and sitting around the table, you know what, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just about a good meal. And it wasn't just about eating food. You know what, it was an event that could last hours. And it was, it was an event where you invited loved ones, you ate with other people. Sometimes there were loved ones, sometimes there were people you didn't know. And the purpose was to have fellowship with one another. That's why communion, the word communion actually is a word koinonia in the Greek. And it actually means fellowship. Fellowship is, you know what, where we spend time with one another. We enjoy one another. And In other words, Jesus met with his disciples that night and he wanted to enjoy their presence. He wanted to spend time with them. It was a little disappointing to him when they're arguing about who is the greatest and they're arguing about who's going to serve and who's going to sit on the right. And and Jesus, you know, but he wanted to spend time with them. He wanted to spend intimate, close time with them. He wanted to have fellowship with them. And of course, you know what? What he does is that he establishes, after, after after a Passover meal, he establishes what we call Holy Communion or the Last Supper. You know, in the Bible, you're going to read in the book of Revelation, there's a lot of banquets that are going to happen in heaven. Amen. There's a wedding supper of the Lamb, and we're going we're gonna to be banqueting with the Lord a lot. And, the, and the, it's not so much that we're going to eat, because you're wondering, are we going to get calories? No, you're not going to get calories. But it's, so much, it's more about the communion, the fellowship, the closeness that we're going to have with one another. You know what? Heaven's going to be a big party. It's not going to be, you know, little ch- chubby angels playing harps on the clouds. No, we're going to enjoy. It's going to be a wonderful time. So, so that's why the Bible, that's why when the religious leaders, they observed Jesus, all he did was banquet, all he did was eat with people, and some of, some of the wrong people. And of course, they misunderstood it, because they, they, they believe that there's certain people you don't hang around with, but what Jesus was doing is that he was developing and building relationships with people. He loved people. And by the way, you can't love people if you don't hang around with them. You know what, you can't, you can't minister, you can't enjoy each other if you're not spending time. I, it's really sad today that a lot of families don't sit around the table and have dinner anymore. You know what? And they're not passing down their values. They're not talking about serious stuff because they're never connecting. We're, 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 we've lost that. We're, we're missing that. But to Jesus and to the Jews, it was very important. Actually, let me tell you, to the Jewish people and to the first Christians, those first century Christians, you know what? They believed that you could experience God best in the context of community. 
as you break bread. So they're always breaking bread. You cannot read the New Testament without reading about them breaking bread. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Jesus has resurrected. You know what? Christian church has moved on now. And it says in Acts 2, 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice what they did. You know what? They were spending time in the teaching of the apostles, in communion, in, in community, and in hanging out with each other. You know what? Not only having communion, but also having dinners together. And of course, they prayed together. Now you say, well, where did that come from? Why did they do that? Because that's what they saw Jesus do. Jesus, during his ministry, he did these things. He'd get away for prayer. You know what? He taught them the Old Testament, the law. You know what? He broke bread with them, with them and with anybody who wanted to break bread with them. And the Bible says that that's what they did. That's what the religious life was like for those only early believers. And they learned that by observing Jesus. That's what Jesus did. So they said, we better do it. Look at what it says in verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Notice that. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. In other words, they were a family. Verse 45. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, later on, you're going to keep reading. When you get to Acts chapter 4, it says in verse 46, it says, So continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. But I want you to notice with simplicity of heart, with singleness of heart, speaks of their motives. In other words, that early church, man, they spent a lot of time together. You know what? They worshiped together. They ate together. They loved one another. They, you know, they, they were there for one another. And I, I tell you, I'm concerned that the church of Jesus Christ has lost that. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons why. But you know, the camaraderie, the commitment, the loving nature of that first century church, that first century community of followers of Jesus, they were, they were there for one another. They, they encouraged one another. And, and they, they, you know, if somebody had a need, you know, you weren't part of that community to have a need and then not know about it and not do something about that need. You see, today there's a lot of people that have needs, but nobody knows because they don't hang around. You know what? They're not in community. You know, they don't, they don't know who to go talk to. That's why every once in a while here at the church we get calls and then, you know what? Uh, uh, I'm traveling through Chino. I ran out of gas. I need some gas money. Where can I pick it up? And I said, we don't give out gas money. Hey, Amen. I don't even know who you are. Well, you know what? We, we're stuck here. I need you to pay for our hotel. We don't pay for hotels. And you know why they have to do that? Because they're not part of a community. They're not part of a family. Uh, you know, probably don't get along with their family, don't, get a, don't have a church family. And, and as a result of that, there are a lot of needs that go. Because when you're hanging around with Christians and you're doing, doing life with other Christians, you're not going to be going through stuff that your brothers and sisters don't know about. And because they want to love you and they care about, we care about one another, they're going to try to do something about it. Amen. It's beautiful when there's that type. And the Bible says the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. And you know why? Because people were observing them. And they were, they were observing the love. They were observing, you know what? And, and they were envious. You know what? They were envious. How do I have that? How do I get that? What do I need to do to be a part of something like that? So the Bible says that the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Why are they being added? Because they see the love. They, see the, they saw the camaraderie. They saw the community. They saw how, you know, uh, how Christians treated one another. Today, we don't see that because most of us go to church and don't know people at church. You know, there's probably half of you that probably know two, three people. There's some of you that don't know, don't know anybody. And I got to confess, I don't know all of you. All right? But, you know what? One of the things that I'm praying for is that Living Word be a community of faith where people love and do life together, enjoy one another, pray for one All the one another's that the Bible talks about, you cannot do apart from community. And I'm praying that that happens. But that's difficult. By the way, what we're seeing in the church, we're also seeing in the society. You know what? There are families that don't get together anymore. And of course, not because people move away. But, but one of the things that sociologists are noticing is that there is, uh, there's not community. There's not the closeness that there used to be. And there's many reasons that they give. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what, what, what sociologists tell us about why this is happening. One of the things that they, they say, uh, you know, there's many, but I find these interesting. One of the things that changed relationships for the worse was the air conditioner. Amen. The air conditioner. Do you remember before air conditioners? And I do. In the fifth, early 50s. You know what? We had swamp coolers. If you had a swamp cooler. And, uh, you know, people would sit outside at night in their porches. Remember that? And they would, hey, neighbor, you know, you, everybody that passed by, every car, every dog, every cat, you know who it was, right? 
And, and, and now, because of air conditioners, you know, people stop sitting in their porches, and now they said, you know what, we can go inside, close the doors, keep the air in, and, and the result of that was, you don't know anybody. I can remember growing up in my little neighborhood where my mom would say, hey, could you go tell, could you go tell Tonya, Tonya Sarah, whack and butter, a uh, bar a block of butter? Uh, or, or can you go and tell her that she has some extra toilet paper, and when I go to the store, I'll, I'll come, I'll, I'll replace it? You guys remember those days? Or am I the only one that that's old, that's that old? Yeah, that's the way it was. That's the way it was. You know what? Uh, we didn't have a TV. The neighbor had a color TV. And you know what? Batman. I remember Batman came out in color. And uh, can I go to the neighbor and say, well, go ask, go ask. You know, don't not show if he lets you see the TV. And we would go there, the neighbors, and, you know, and watch Batman in color. Now, when you're a 9, 10-year-old kid, that's pretty amazing. But there was community. No one would ever do that. How many of you would go and ask your neighbor, do you have an extra loaf of bread that you can? Nobody would do that. Can my kids go watch cable? None of us would do that. But another thing they said happened was the air conditioner started it. And then, of course, garages. You know, there used to be a time we had no garages. And then you had a carport. And now you have an enclosed garage. So before, you parked outside in the street or on the lawn, wherever, and you greeted people, you know, passing by. No more. And then the garage... Uh, you know, opener and closure came in. Now you can park your car in its little own house. You can use that little thing. You don't even have to go outside and see anybody if anyone's outside. No one is outside anyway. All right? So all of those things have had an effect on our inter interaction with our neighbors. Most of us don't know our neighbors. And of course, our neighbors are changing every two, three years, they tell us anyway. But all of these things have made it very difficult. You know, and then of course, you know, we started putting fences around our property. I grew up in a little town, there were no fences. If I wanted to go steal uh, pomegranates from the neighbor, I just walked across and climbed a tree and got some pomegranates. I wanted some figs. I wanted some, because they grew all of that in the backyard. There was no fences that I had to jump. Amen. And now, you know what? We have fences. We fence out our neighbors. Now we have gated communities. You cannot get in without a special code. All of those, and of course, and I understand. I'm not, I'm not naive. I understand the, the situation has sort of caused that to happen. But it has affected community and how we interact with one another. You know, I remember there used to be a neighborhood watch. I don't know how many neighborhood watches there are anymore. I remember we used to do block parties for, for, for Halloween, for Fourth of July. You know, and the neighbors would come out and, you know, instead of knocking on doors, they're out there. And they have a band and they had hot dogs. And, and it was for those that were better off would share with us that were poorer. It was pretty amazing. Now, that still happens, but not, not in California anyway, very few times, maybe in the Midwest. And then you add to that, the, the sociology, then technology kicks in. You know, you remember, you had a phone, and, and I, I remember, you remember the party lines? Yes. Where you pick up the phone, and it wasn't for you, it was for the neighbor or the other person that were on that line? Now, those of you that are young, you have no clue what I'm talking about. But there was a time we had phones, you pick it up, but it wasn't for you, it was for the other house, for the neighbor, or for someone else. You know, so I said, well, I'm going to hang up and uh, call again, and they'll pick it up. And sometimes if you want to be sneaky, you could pick up the phone, and you could hear their conversations. <laughs> You could eavesdrop. You know, we trusted each other, amen. Didn't lock the doors. Left the, you know, in Arizona, left the door open, screen door, you know, and for, get some air. You know, and, and, and then, uh, you know, the answering machine comes in. You don't have to answer calls. You know, uh, uh, you could, then be, you know, leave a message and, and then, if, you know, I'll call you back. And that way you could sort of screen your calls. And then call her ID came. Now you don't have to even listen. You can watch. I don't want to talk to that person. I'm not going to answer the phone. You know what? I'm not interested. All right? And then, and then if you move on, now, now we have, you know, we have online shopping. You know, you have to go to the store before to buy your clothes and buy your food. Now you could do it all online. You know, now I don't have to put my makeup on. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to, you know what, put my wig. I don't have to do any of that. You know, and our interaction is being limited more and more every single day. Right? As a matter of fact, I find it interesting. There are some people that still have to go to the store and they show up in their pajamas. Say, Amen. Have you noticed that? It's like, wow. <laughs> Things have changed a lot. Now, I'm not, no, no, I'm not. Uh, some of you do it. I'm not trying to put anybody down, but I, but I find that interesting. Very interesting. And then, of course, with social media. Now, on social media, you want to stay in touch with somebody, you just go and tap their likes, you know. Uh, you see them, man, good seeing you. You guys look great, great picture. Thumbs up, 100%. You know, uh, hey, let's get together for lunch. You don't want to do lunch. They don't want to do lunch. But you don't care. You're not going to see them anyway for a while, right? You know, when social media came out, uh, sociology felt that's going to connect people more than ever before, and it has. 
it has connected people at distance, you're more in touch with them. But those of us that are close, it has actually disconnected us. Uh, what, what they're learning is that, you know what, social media doesn't foster relationships. As a matter of fact, you know what, it hurts relationships. Because for the first time, you're seeing people be very brutal and very nasty and mean. You know what, people that wouldn't tell you something to your face, now they'll put it on there. They don't care. They're not going to see you anyway. You know what, you do whatever you want. And then you add to that, they don't care about it being accurate. You know, there's all this fake stuff out there. And social media, what they're finding out, and that's why now government is trying to put more restrictions on it because it's going to get out of control. Now, AI is a huge problem because now you can make up stories and make them look real. But I, what I'm telling you is all of that has affected our interaction with one another. You know, not to mention the conflict that online social media creates. That's why I want to warn you. You know what? Don't get, don't get in fights on, the, on, the, on social media. Somebody posts something, you disagree, just sort of go, hmm, interesting. And you know what? Leave it alone. You know what? Because you're going to respond. They're going to beat you up because there's a lot of mean people on social media. Amen. Amen. The other day, you know, I, I, I'm on social media. I am. And uh, I try not to be on it too much. Amen. But I do. And uh, I like reading our Chino Connect media. Man, the other day a lady posted, hey, uh, I'm looking for a plumber. Anyone have any suggestions? One guy wrote, hey, listen, that's why we have Google. Go to Google and put in plumber, and it's going to tell you who the plumbers are. Then somebody jumped back and said, hey, why are you so mean? It's a simple question. That's what we do on Chino Connect. But there's some mean people. <laughs> there's some mean people. <laughs> Amen. Okay. You know, I like what one sociologist said. One sociologist said, you know what? We've become so fake with one another that it's hard to distinguish who's real and who's not. Amen. Because all our social medias are best, you know, the best, the highlights of our lives. So, you know, we have that. And then you had COVID happen. You know what COVID did for the first time? People were already working from their homes. But COVID sort of accelerated people working from home. Uh, people sort of, uh, COVID accelerated, you know what, people not wanting to go out. Uh, online services, churches, you now, you don't even have to go to church. You know what, stay home with your coffee, with your pajamas, and watch the service online. And you know what that has done? It has sort of created this lack of community. There are still Christians, a lot of Christians, that are not attending church because they're watching online. Pastor, I'm watching online. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not beating up on anybody. I'm not, I'm not, but I'll tell you what, it's not the same. You worshiping with us in your living room on watching the TV than coming and being here. There's something very special about when you say, I have a need. You know what? And writing that I have a need and telling somebody I have a need and they say, let me pray with you. Or, or raising, setting up, laying stuff. You cannot compare it. You know, it's like a fireplace. I, I, I like the Yule log during Christmas, Channel 9. You know, they do it about that time, New Year. But you know what? I like it when there's a real fireplace. Amen. And I'm feeling the warmth of it. There's a big difference. So, you know, if I were to read the verse that I read to you in Acts chapter 2 that describes what they did, if I were to read that to you today, this is what it would look like and this is what it would sound like. It says, the Christians were devoted to themselves and occasionally got to church when they had time. No one was filled with awe because there were no signs and wonders performed by the believers. Very few of the believers were together, and they had almost nothing in common because they had no real time for each other. If they sold something, they used the money to buy something better for themselves. They ate on the run. They kept to themselves. They were too rushed to enjoy one another or give praise to God. They claimed to love God, but they don't really love each other. And they felt and they feel very empty and alone. As a result, most people disliked them. And very few people were ever saved. I know that's an exaggeration, but I think there's a lot of truth in that. Can I hear a, can I hear a good amen? amen? So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that my prayer would be that living world would be a community, a faith community of committed people. Committed to Jesus. Committed to each other. Committed to do all the one another's. Love and courage. You know what? Pray for one another. All those type of things. But here's the problem. You've got to be in church for that to happen. You've got to be committed to a fellowship for that to happen. You know, so what I want to do is I want to just sort of make the point that we need each other. We need to belong. We need uh, our faith community. And we need to be faithful and committed. Not because, you know, I, I want to see you here, but you benefit. I want to see, but you benefit from it. So let me give you two simple thoughts before I, I wind down. I'm winding down. Two simple things, you know what, that we need to do if we're going to have community together and we're going to share the love of Jesus Christ together. Because we live in a world today that values independence. We, we highly value independence. Everybody wants to be financially independent, relationally independent. You know what? I don't want to need you. You know what? There's a lot of people who say, I don't need the church. I don't need Christians. Well, listen, here's the problem. 
If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not independent. You have to be dependent. And the first thing you need to be dependent of is you need to be dependent of the Lord. I depend on Jesus every single day. You know what? And there are, I, I can't be independent. You cannot become a follower of Jesus Christ and, and be independent. You cannot save yourself. You cannot make it yourself. You cannot be all that you want to be, being by yourself, by a lone ranger. As a matter of fact, all that you are and going to be, God's going to use his people to mold you and to help you. I am who I am because of brothers and sisters that took me under their wings when I was a 16, 17-year-old boy and taught me. I am who I am because in church that I went to, they gave me an opportunity to use my gifts. I am who I am because, you know, God called me and people said, you know what, come, we, we need a pastor. You know, and, and, and none of that would have happened if I would have been on my own, independent, apart from the church. Here's what I'm telling you. You cannot be all God wants you to be if you are independent. You need to have, you know what, a relationship with Jesus, and that means you have to be dependent. And then you need to be part of the body of Christ because as the part of the body of Christ, that's how we function. That's how, how, that's how God's work. That's how we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm telling you is this. You know what? You have a personal relationship. You need it. But you also need a shared relationship with your brothers and your sisters. All right? So I want to encourage you. Here's number one. If you're taking notes, number one, I want to encourage you to share the love of Jesus Christ with others, especially your church. Okay? But to do that, you have to be in church. Now, by the way, people not going to church has been a problem since day one. Over there in Hebrews, in chapter 10, verse 24, notice what it says. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. First of all, notice, you know what? We're supposed to encourage. That word to stir up is to sort of rattle. Hey, come on. You know, we can do better. You know what? You can do better. We can do more together. You know, we can love people. We can share the love of Jesus Christ. But to do that, you've got to be in church. Notice what he says in verse 25. Not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, what he says, look at, stir one another, encourage one another. But you can't do that if you're isolated. So stop. Come to church. Be a part of it. Commit to a, commit to a fellowship. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. And here's the problem today. One of the biggest challenges today is that people are giving up on meeting together in church. I want you to know presence matters. You being in church is powerful. People seeing you and you greeting them and loving them and getting their name and chit-chatting for them for a little bit, there's powerful. There's, there's power in telling somebody, you know what, I'm praying for you. It's different. You know what, when we lock hands and we, we seek God together, there's something about being together that makes, you know, something more meaningful. That's why Jesus said these words in, in Matthew 18, 20. He said, for wherever two or three are gathered, drawn together as my followers in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He's with you when you're by yourself, but there's something special that happens, you know what, when we're together. Amen. And, and you experience it when you're in church. It's better to sing with others than to sing by yourself. It's better to, you know, pray with, you know, when there's more pray. It's more exciting where, you know what, there's more people. It's exciting. There's something about the presence of God's people when they come together. Amen. But can I be honest with you? And uh, whether you say no, I'm still going to be honest with you. Amen. <laughs> The biggest concern I have right now is that research is showing that the average American Christian attends church one time a month. Now, let's put that in perspective. Let me try to explain what that means. Once a month, the average good Christian. Amen. Now, I, I don't know what to do with that, honestly. When I read that statistic, it sort of floors me. You know, one and a half hour a month. You guys are on your social media more than that, a day, right? In front of a TV, more than that, a day. You know, and, and, and I ask myself, how, God, how am I going to help people grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ if I see them an hour and a half a month? And Jesus says, you can't. But then I say, Lord, but I know they're watching TV, Christian TV. I know they're listening to radio. I know they're having devotions on their own. And, you know, so it's not just an hour and a half. They're probably doing more. But, you know, it's the word says that's not enough. You have to come together with the body of Christ. Amen. Now, here's what I want you to know. If it's easy for you, because here's what the Bible teaches. If it's easy for you to skip church for something else. Well, Pastor, it was a nice day. We, or it was a terrible, the weather was terrible. Or, you know what, we had some stuff to do and. You know, my yard's been neglected, now with all this rain. You know what? And I'm tired because I had to work on Saturday. You know what? Or we went to the Dodger game. I didn't get home until 1. You know, or I had to be 
the town. But here's what I'm telling you. If, if there is always an excuse for you to not be in church, don't be surprised when you grow cold to the spiritual things. There's going to come the day where you're going to convince yourself, I don't need church. I don't need God. But I also want to tell you, your kids are watching you. And your kids are learning church is not important. You know what? Spiritual things are not important. And your kids are going to grow up, and they're going to get married, and they're going to have kids, and they're not going to want to go to church. And you're going to tell them, hey, we've got to dedicate your baby. We've got to, you know, you've got to get back. I don't, I, don't see, I don't think that's important, Dad. And you know why they believe that? Because that's what they've observed you doing. And, and I'll tell you, one of the most powerful things that you can demonstrate for your kids is being in church. Let them know this is important. This is important for me. You know, before I was a pastor, going to church was important to me. You know, and I, I feel bad for, for many of you. And I understand there's a lot of distractions. You know what, now they're doing baseball, football, basketball on Sundays. But I'll tell you what, your kids are going to realize, you're gonna, if, you, if you're doing that with them all the time, and you should, there, there, sometimes you should. I'm not trying to put anybody in a guilt trip. But there comes a point where you have to say, you know, hijo, you know, daughter, church and God and meeting with God's people is more important. So we'll let you do, we can do everything. And I'll tell you, they're never going to forget because you have, you have sort of taken a stand and said, this is a priority. You know, we need each other. Now, Jesus demonstrated that, gathered his disciples for communion. Jesus demonstrated that as he goes about eating and spending time and breaking bread. You know what he's doing? He understands the importance of camaraderie and friendships. So I want to encourage you, love one another, the church. Don't rush off. At least say hi. How are you doing? You know what? If you see somebody down, because you know people that are struggling, you'll see it in their face. Just say, you know, everything okay? How can I pray for you? Hold on to their hand and say, Lord, just bless this person. Help them, Lord. I don't know what they're going through. You know what? Look around and see the needs. Hopefully you see some paper on the floor. Pick it up. Amen. You know, do something that shows that you're part of this. Can I hear a good amen to that? And then the second thing I want to say to you, so, so love people. Love people at church. But I, I want to also encourage you to share the love of Jesus with the community of people. In other words, committed community of people. Ongoing community of people. Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, I I can't possibly know everybody, you know, that comes to church. But, you know, in that case, then, get involved in a small group. Get involved in men's ministry. Get involved in women's. Get involved in grief share. Get involved in the marriage. You know what? Get involved. Help. Get involved in a group of people and be committed to them. In other words, say, I'm here. And as you get to interact with them, whatever you learn about them, you know, pray for them, encourage them, help them out. Some of you have a lot of wisdom. Share the wisdom, especially with the younger people. So that's why the Bible says in the book of Acts, they broke bread in their homes. They ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. So a couple of things I want you to notice from that. You know what? It doesn't happen by accident. It has to happen on purpose. You have to make a decision in your life that says, you know, I'm going to get some roots. You know what? I'm going to participate in the faith community. And you know what, good and bad, busy or not, I will commit to a a body and I'm going to have communion with them, all right? I'm going to do that. And, uh, you know, you have to decide. It's something that has to be intentional. You have to commit to it. You know, and and some of you say, you know, Pastor, I I don't know if I want to commit to Living Word. We're at Living Word right now. So uh, let me just be honest and, and don't take this wrong. If you cannot make a commitment to get roots at Living Word, find somewhere where you can get roots. And you can say, you know what? I can do life with these people. I can do life with this ministry. I can do life with these people. And if this is not the place with all the love I have in my heart, I understand. I wish you would. But I tell you, I'm not helping you, and I'm not teaching you, and I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be if I let you just come whenever you want, and you're not plugged in. Now, don't stop coming, Mom, Pastor. Then I'm not, no, 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 keep coming. But at some point, when you're really serious about developing a relationship with God, also think about a shared relationship with your brothers and your sisters. The second thing I want, to, I want you to notice, you know what, other people are going to look, other people are going to watch this. You know, I, have, I, I know what's going to happen. When you start being a part of a community of a church, you know what, your life is going to flourish. There's going to be something that's going to happen. People are going to watch you, and they're going to want it. You know, how, how do I be a part of that? And, and you know what, you can tell them, you know what, I don't want to be weird and I don't want to be pushy, but you can come to church with me, amen. You can come to my group with me. And no, 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 uh, uh, they won't want me. No, they'll want you, they'll accept you. I promise you, Living Word is a welcoming, loving church. You know what, it's a church that doesn't judge and, and put people down. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Just because they don't wear their hair or the length of it or what, the, you know, we love people because that's what Jesus does. He loves people. But people are watching you. 
and people are observing, invite them. They want to know, what is it about you that brings so much meaning to your life and so much peace? And tell them, you know what, I, I love Jesus. I'm a part of the body of Christ. Amen. You know, and uh, tell them they're welcome. So why did Jesus come? Jesus came that we might have life and ha have it to the fullest. He came to pay the price for our sins. And Jesus came eating and drinking. He came doing life with other people. He would bring his best friends together and he'd break bread with them because it was impossible to worship God, you know, as God deserves by yourself. We don't just, you know what, we need shared relationships. So I want to encourage you to do that. My prayer is that today I wanted you to understand one thing. We need each other. You know what, we can do more together. We're better together. You know what, we can accomplish more. Not only for others, but for yourself and for your family. Amen. And uh, I'm really excited because, you know, we founded this church 33 years ago, my wife and I. And, you know, some of the leaders that we have now were little kids. Now they're our leaders, some of our main leaders. And it's beautiful. And I know the families are excited to see their kids growing up in church and loving the Lord and serving the Lord. That's a powerful thing. And that's available to you. Amen. Especially in the crazy world that we live in. We live in a crazy world. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father God, I ask today that you would stir us out of our comfort zone, out of our garages and fenced-in air-conditioned houses. And God, that we would uh, do life together to the best of our ability. Because there's benefit in serving you and there's benefit in loving, Lord, our faith community. And Father, I thank you for so many who, who long for more intimate relationships. And God, may we be committed to one another and that we would meet needs all over our communities, all over our church and beyond around the world as we're doing right now. I pray, God, that you would give us a great desire to show your love. Lord, starting with each other here, breaking bread, doing life together in a way that changes lives and honors you. Help us to join our voices to celebrate who you are. Father, we thank you that that's available to us. Forgive us for getting away from that. Forgive us for getting distracted, Lord, by the so many uh, things that lure us away from your purpose for our lives. So, Father, we come to you. Restore, Lord, koinonia, community. Lord, and as we come around the table of the Lord, we're reminded. That's why we call it communion. It's a time of intimacy, closeness. As you keep praying, uh, and every eye is still closed, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian family. I went to church when I was a kid. And there came a point I didn't go to church anymore. But I still believed in God. But I did not know him. You know, following Jesus and serving God is not about knowing about God. It's not about quoting Bible verses. It's not saying I go to church every once in a while. You know what? It's not really trying harder. It's knowing Him. It's having a relationship. That's why Jesus came. To reveal the Father. So that you could see the love of God. God is real. And Jesus hung out with sinners. And He hung out with the, the worst of the worst of His days. The lowest of the low. The biggest sinners. The biggest partiers. The people that religion rejected. That's who Jesus loved. He didn't leave them there. Once he related to them, Lord, he showed them that there was a better life. Father, I pray for those that are here today. And if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to do that. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to say, Lord, I'm turning to you. And uh, Lord, I, I, I'm not really sure what all that means. But I, I know there is an emptiness, emptiness in my soul and I do believe you're the only one that can fill it. Fill it today. Forgive me of my sins. Lord, it's to you that I confess. Lord, it's to you that I want to serve and honor. I realize it's not by, Lord, by my actions. It's not by my rituals. It's not by the ceremonies I go through. Lord, it's by a, it comes from a heart that loves you. So Father, forgive us of our sins. Father, help us. I pray for those that God, that are opening their heart to you right now, that you would flood their hearts, fill them with your presence. Lord, and let them experience your love. It's, it's easier to express love to others when we have experienced your love. And Father, I pray and I ask you these things. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. Today is Communion Sunday, and uh, let's get ready to take communion. So on the night prior to his crucifixion, Jesus met with his disciples, and he wanted to break bread. Remember, the table was an intimate. He wanted to have a, an intimate conversation. He wanted to talk to them. Even though he had told them, surely I'll be gone, they didn't really get it. 
but he poured out his heart he loved them to the end the Bible says and it was around the table you know uh, the table was such an intimate place that when we think of communion we think of chairs and a table but in the Jewish culture they didn't sit at chairs and tables they actually leaned over on, a, on one of the elbows and they would eat and you know and they would converse and they were in each other's face as a matter of fact the Bible tells us that John the Apostle he would lean on the chest of Jesus and uh, you know it was a time of it was a time of closeness it was a time of let's get together let's do life together and when we come to the table of the Lord the Lord once again reminds us I want to do life with you I want us to do life together you know what I don't want you to be a lone ranger and do life by yourself you know what I if you let me I, we will do life I will be with you every single moment and not only just, you know, the, the meal was a very special time. But Jesus says, I will always be with you. So today the Lord invites you to the table. If you're a Christian, open your heart to Jesus Christ. Participate with us. Uh, we do not believe that if you're not of living word or of our faith, you know what, you can't. If you've accepted Christ, if you haven't accepted Christ, you probably don't need to be doing communion because communion is about recognizing what Christ did on the cross for us. It's giving thanks. Eucharist, the word Eucharist, Eucharistao in the Greek actually is a word that means thank you. You know what, when, when, the, when the Catholics say the Eucharist, they are saying we're thankful for what God did for us. But how can you be thankful for what God did for you if you haven't received it or accepted it? How can you say, Lord, thank you if you have rejected it? It's like somebody giving you a Christmas gift and you say, thank you for the gift and you just throw it aside and you see him and you say, thank you for the gift and you're like, you didn't even open it up. What are you, what are you thanking me for? Well, for the gesture. No, the gesture is not enough. You know what, I want you to open it. So today, there's an invitation. Come to the table of the Lord. Father, thank you for your love for us, that you send your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Lord, as we come, we come humbly. Lord, we come with a repentant heart. We come with confession. Forgive us of our sins. Lord, your word says that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, some of us have not reflected you in our lives these days. Lord, our words are not words that would honor you. Our thoughts are not thoughts that would honor you. Our actions, Lord, they contradict what we claim to believe. Forgive us, Lord. Come into our lives. I pray I ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take communion together. The blood that Jesus shed
the night of his uh, betrayal, Jesus met with his disciples. And they had a very intimate, close time. Jesus pours out his heart to them. And after they had eaten the Passover meal, taken communion, the Bible says that he said, let's go and pray. His heart was heavy. I love it. One of the, one of the things we don't hear often is that as they're leaving, they sing a hymn, they sung. You know, when they got together, they sung a lot. And you say, well, what did they sing? Well, they sang the Psalms. The, Psalm, the Psalms was their hymn book. And there were certain Psalms that they read during the Passover, the Hallel Psalms, the, the Jewish commentators tell us. And, and they, would, they would sing them and they would read them. And they would encourage one another. And uh, that night Jesus met with them and he loves them. I want you to know he loves you today. He loved them to the end. You know what, as fickle as they were, as crazy as they were, uh, he loved them. And he loves you. And when we come to the table of the Lord, we're not only remembering, remembering what he did. We know what he did, but why he did it. Because he loves you. And don't let anyone ever tell you God doesn't love you. Don't let yourself tell you God doesn't love you. God's done with you. God doesn't care. Don't, let, don't ever sabotage God's will and God's purpose for your life. But I fail. I know you fail. We all fail. Get up. Shake it off. And what? Tell Lord with your help. I'm going to move forward. So the Apostle Paul, talking to us about communion, he said, Paul writes these words to the Corinthians. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that in the night in which he was betrayed, after having given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, This is my body which is broken for you. The bread, symbol of the body of Christ, symbolizes what Christ did for us. And when we receive it and we take it, we're only testifying to those that are watching and those that observe, you know, I have experienced the forgiveness of God. And because of that, I want you to know, and I don't ever want to forgive. That's why we do it in remembrance of Christ, the bread, the body of Christ, beaten and broken, taking your punishment, your wrath. Take it together with me. And after he had taken the bread, Jesus took the cup. And he looked to his disciples and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it and do it in remembrance of me until I come again. Jesus is coming again. The wine is a symbol of the blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus Christ and his body, he took our punishment, our wrath, our healing, everything we needed. But it was his blood that was shed that allows our sins to be forgiven. The wine, the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's take it together. Would you raise up a prayer, a praise to God? God, we love you today. Lord, thank you for one day, Lord, allowing us to hear the gospel and give in our lives. Lord, I look back and I, I thank you that one day my great-grandparents, God, received Christ. And as a result, my grandparents did. And as a result, my parents did. And as a result, Lord, we have. And as a result, our children have. And now our grandchildren, Lord. Lord, my prayer is, God, that the Ruiz family would always be a family that honors you and serves you. And God, that are devout followers of Jesus Christ. At a time, Lord, where many people are walking away. Lord, we're only one generation away from losing faith. Father, we just thank you for your good work. Lord, we cannot do it without your help. Touch our hearts. I pray for your people today, Lord. Lord, we go through stuff that discourages us. Lord, we go through stuff every day that tells us quit. It's not worth it. But Lord, help us to stand strong and be steadfast and be devoted to you. Lord, I pray. I pray for sick people today. Touch them, Lord. I pray for people, Lord, that are going through difficult times and wondering, is there any help? I tell them there is. God, embrace them with your love and today. Lord, I ask you, I pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me, please? As you stand, can you join me in giving the Lord a big praise of applause? Of, Lord, thank you for what you've done. God has been good to us. Listen, good to see you. My desire is that the Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will pour out his favor upon you. That he may turn his face toward you. You will experience the joy, the peace, the blessings of God. I pray that you will leave here today understanding that not only do you need a relationship with Christ, but you need a shared relationship with your brothers and sisters. Plug in, commit, get some roots. We love you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Greet one another. Love one another. See you Wednesday at 7.15. God bless you guys. Love you. Love you guys. God bless.